we're going to pick up talking about the Harry Alleman trial. Bob, you had previously sketched out how the case was presented to you by Pat Marcy for you to defend Harry Alleman. Alleman was already charged. I guess it was in pretrial that they came to you. And you had known the judge, who was Frank Wilson. Alleman was represented by Maloney at the time. Who Tom later, Maloney. Right. Tom Maloney, who has, who has a notorious history further in his career involved when he became a judge in Greylord. Talk about the Alleman case further. It, it was a short time. It was probably only <clears throat> maybe a week or two after I had agreed to become partners with Johnny DiArco. Shortly after this, Johnny asked me if I knew who Pat Marcy was, and I told him yes. And he said he'd like to talk to you. And that was the very first time I met Pat. I always thought Pat was the secondary person there in the media and the newspapers and the rest. Whenever they talked about the first ward, many times they mentioned it was run by the mob. They mentioned that Diarco himself had been a member of the Al Capone mob. And anyhow, Pat Marcy contacted me and I agreed after I got the police reports and, and I was introduced to the head of the organized crime section in the state's attorney's office. Mike Ficaro, I uh, I began working on the case. And first thing I did, though, was after I looked at the case, I saw what a weak case it was. Uh, they had uh, two witnesses that totally contradicted each other. Uh, the one witness gave one statement the night of the shooting and gave a completely different statement three years later when they contacted him. But when I got involved in the case, Pat Marcy asked me if I if I knew of a judge that could handle the case. And when he told me that, I knew the language. Uh, they meant to basically fix the case. How did they manipulate the case to end up in the judge's hands that they wanted? Was that Marcy's skill? I mean, in Mar- 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 well, Mar- Mar- Marcy and Diarco are kind of one in the same in that Diarco's a made member of the mob, but he's an elected official. And Marcy is also a made member of the mob. And but a figurehead and that he's appointed a secretary, so to speak. But how does Marcy have the power to navigate this case to the judge? They controlled absolutely everything. The people that were in these positions, they were the ones who made these judges. They had taken complete control over the election system. All the elections were done through the first ward. And the people from the the license commission, all these people were placed in their position by the first ward. And they had taken complete control over all the elections. Everybody that wanted to run for office had to come to them. They were the ones that fixed the elections. And so the it's as I simple is, it's as simple as Pat Marcy calling the elected or non-elected official who places court cases with certain judges or some chief judge, and Marcy says this Alleman case needs to go to this judge. I'll I'll explain the whole system to you. The way the system worked was. Uh, When a person does get indicted, uh, for whatever reason, and the paperwork is drawn up to be assigned out to a judge, the case would go to before the chief judge. At 26 in California, the main courtroom, every morning there would be probably 100 people or more uh, running around in the courtroom and behind the courtroom. They'd have all these prisoners. You're brought before a judge, and when when you walk in there and you go up towards the front, there's a huge bench up there about maybe two, three feet above, you know, above the floor level. And there there you've got, in the center of it, you've got the judge sitting there. Next to him, to the left of him, you'll have uh, one or two people. Uh, you'll have a prosecutor and you'll have a public defender. To the right of him, in a short distance away, you had a, com- you had a girl sitting there behind the computer. But it was a computer that you would read. It, when you put the information in there, it would show up on the screen that there would be nothing else other than that would show up on the screen. And, and to the left to the left of the judge, again, a little bit lower, you'd have three or four people. You'd have a couple of clerks. So there'd be about seven people behind, you know, behind that desk. Unbelievably noisy, very chaotic of sorts. Behind them, again, now you've got the door opening up in the back uh, to the judge's chambers, and you've got people coming in and out of there. What happens is, when the case gets called, uh, most of the people would be in custody. And back in the, the jail they had back there behind the courtroom. It, when they called the case, prisoner would be brought up by a couple of, there were, there were actually about four or five um, deputies that were working there. Uh, you would have the prisoner brought up and you go up and you stand before the judge and the judge 
The judge will indicate case number. Then he'll ask the girl to the right of him. He'll then he'll say case number such and such. And she's supposed to read off the name of the judge that shows up in the computer. Now, no, nobody else can see it but her. She's sitting over there in the corner. And, uh, and she'll read off the name. What happens then is, you know, then you're assigned to a judge. Uh, you're assigned to a judge and you're sent upstairs. One of the clerks would then take the file upstairs to whatever court. There were about 10 courtrooms upstairs. They would take the file upstairs to one of the one of the judges, and he would fill out the paperwork there. Uh, and his clerk would fill out the paperwork, indicating this case was assigned to him. And you go you go up before that judge now, and you well they ask you to enter a plea in, in the lower court. And you how do you plead? You everybody pleads not guilty down there. You get assigned upstairs to a judge, and the judge then would assign certain dates where certain things were supposed to happen. And now you've got 10 days. The system in Illinois is very interesting. You've got 10 days to decide whether or not, you know, you you want that judge. If you decide you don't want the judge, you don't have to give any reason for it. You just indicate you don't want this judge and you can name two other judges you don't want. Then the case, then what happens then is the clerk there will call downstairs talk to the chief clerk downstairs and indicate that this person has filed a substitution of judges and they will call them back and give and give them a new judge. That's how the system is supposed to work to keep it from being corrupted. Well, it turns out that Pat knows the chief judge. You know, the, the chief judge became the chief judge because the first ward makes him the chief judge. Judge Comerford, who's the, who's the top judge of all the courts, he would be over at Counselor's Rose five days a week. He was, in essence, doing the bidding of Marcy. They they were doing what they're told because, as I said, any anybody who ran for any office had to get the okay from the first war because they fixed all the elections. Let's go back to Frank Wilson and your conversations with him about steering the case towards him. After I approached the judge and he indicated that, you know, if I could get the case to him, that that he would take it. Uh, I go back to counselors, and Pat Marcy now tells me, Tom Maloney, who was his lawyer, wanted to try the case. And Pat, that's when Pat told me. He said, we're going to make him a judge. We're going to have the Supreme, the Supreme Court is going to appoint him a judge within the next couple of months. And he wants to try Harry Alleman's case. He wants to be the lawyer on the case, which to me made no sense. Here's somebody who's going to be named the judge, who wants to be involved in a, in a, in a mob, a supposed mob hit case and whatever. But I wanted no part of him being involved in the case, you know, because I knew the man, I despised the man. I knew he was vile in every sense of the word. And so I told Pat that I would get somebody else. The, Frank Wilson himself I thought, didn't think it was a good idea for me to try the case if it was a bench because everybody knew we were very close friends. Pat Marcy tells me there's a lawyer that's retired and down and living down in Florida, Frank Whalen. And that was the one he wanted me to, you know, he wanted me to have on the case. What happens now a short time later, and I talked about that, I think before, when I get a call from, from Marco, Marco D'Amico, who I meet with two, three times a week because he's paying me in all these gambling cases he's sending my way. There was one of, there was a bar over on Harlem, a bar in the basement of a of a motel, where I would go once, twice a week. I would be there, and uh, he indicated, "Are you coming? To, are you coming tonight?" And I told him yes. And when I get there, he takes me upstairs, and here comes Harry Alleman, who, who comes into the uh, comes into the room, and he again tells me, among other things, that he wants Tom Maloney wants to try the case, and he told me too. He said he's going to be named. The Supreme Court's going to name him a judge, and uh, he had already known that. And uh, and I said, well, the, the judge doesn't like him, doesn't want him on the case, and that's the end of that. I said, Do you guys want to use him? Find somebody else to handle it. Well, we get beyond that. Now uh, I get a hold of a Waylon. I said, I've got an investigator that's going to investigate the the second witness. Harry knew uh, Louis Almeida. It was somebody he had basically grown up with. And I said, I'm going to get a, have an investigator check out this guy's background. I said, I've seen the case. I said, it's a terribly weak case. 
They've got two people contradicting each other. You've got the driver of the car and you've got this so-called witness who gave one prior statement and now gives a totally different scenario as to what happened. I said, it's a great case. I said, what I'll do is I'll, I'll work on it. I'll get it together and I'll come out to meet you down there in Florida. I met with the private investigator and he gave me the information on the second witness who had been arrested a number of times, had been fired from a couple of jobs for stealing. He had been arrested at that time on a uh, on a theft for, for a gas station he worked at where he stole some money from there. He had given a prior statement where he indicated he was at the house and opened the door and let the dog run out and, and so forth, but couldn't but gave a description different than the driver of the car as, as to what the car looked like. I go out to see him. I go out to visit with him in Florida, and I go over the whole case, and I show him what, what I've got. It's an absolute, in my opinion, an absolute throw-out case. I, I come back to Chicago. I'm there for a while. I meet with Harry a couple of times, and Harry indicates he's got like four people that will indicate that he was shooting He was shooting golf on that day with him. Uh, I, I meet again with the private investigator. I, I basically print out what I think is a, you know my defense for the case. I filed a second time to go see Frank Whalen. You know, and and so forth. Now, when he comes back into town the day before the the day before the uh, trial, I meet with him over at the Bismarck Hotel. Bismarck Hotel was about a block and a half from Counselor's Row. Uh, I go over and I meet with him there. He meets and sits down with Harry and so forth, and the case is ready to go to trial. What is his expertise, Waylon? No, he was a retired lawyer from Chicago. He was supposed to be one of the top lawyers in Chicago. That's, but I had no idea who he was. He was before my time. Pat wanted to bring it, bring somebody in from out of town. I wanted to bring in my own lawyer, uh, but Pat wouldn't let me. He insisted on on getting him involved in the case. Why I don't know, but that's that was his his motivation for it. He's out of he's from out of town, so it won't look bad when the case is over. The case goes to trial. No idea what's going on. I'm reading the papers, and the papers are indicating it's a great case. They've got this witness and the second witness. Nothing, you know, nothing at all there from the reports that I had, the reports that I gave the, I gave Waylon. At this point, you're on the sidelines, so to speak. The judge knows what the deal is at this point. So really, your work is done. You don't need to do anything except wait well, for yeah, the verdict. But, but I insist, I insist on making it a great case. The, the reason judges love me. And the reason Pat and the others wanted to use me on these cases they were fixing is because I would give the judge something to hang his hat on, as we said. I developed a case there showing that the two witnesses totally contradicted each other. The second witness obviously was lying. You know, when he, when he claims he was 15 feet from this person, he couldn't tell, he couldn't say what kind of clothes he was wearing or how tall he was or anything. Yet he claimed he saw a 45, him shooting with a 45 when he was never shot with a 45. All you needed to do was create one shred of reasonable doubt. And that's what the judge needed. And that was your game plan. Yes. Normally you might have some minor parts. These were not minor. These were major. You had two witnesses giving two different stories. You've got the driver of the car who indicates that he sat in the back seat. He had a uh, sawed-off shotgun. She never put the shotgun out the window. Just sat in the back seat. Called Billy over and you know said hi, Billy, and then shot him. And then he told me to slowly drive away. You got the second witness. First statement totally different from the second. In the first statement, he's a block away. He's at the end of the block, you know, looking at a situation. And now he indicates he's 15 feet from the shooter. And, uh, you know, and, and indicating he got out of the car and he shot him with a 45 when he was never shot with a 45. He was shot with a shotgun. And, of course, uh, your conversations with Alleman were always, he was at the golf club. He was golfing. The, I never asked him. I never asked any of my clients. I would never ask my client, you know, when I represented somebody, you know, did you do it? I never would. I knew a vast majority of them obviously did, or they wouldn't have been arrested. I can't think of a jury trial I had when I didn't put my client in the stand. All my clients took the stand. They got up there and, and, and they denied. They denied what they did. And my argument was always to the jury. I would never argue to a jury he didn't do it. 
I would argue for the most part, he might have and he might not have. And, and I've shown you good reason why, you, you know, there's a possibility he didn't do it. You have an obligation to follow the law. You took an oath that you would follow the law. And if you couldn't find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, you have an obligation to, you know, to find him not guilty. That doesn't mean he's innocent. That just means you can't find him guilty. Anyhow, what happens now, while the case is on trial, it's on trial for three or four days. And I'm reading the papers because I didn't go into the courtroom. I stayed away. And I told the judge not to come to my restaurant, not to come to Greco's, uh, because too many people would see him there. And then and they would possibly then put, you know, put him put him with me. Uh, after the case was going on for about four or five days, whatever the case took, I get a call from Frank Wilson. Apparently called me from the payphone out in front of the courthouse. And he said, you know, can I meet with you? I met him at a restaurant over on Western. And when I met him there, he was all shook up. In fact, I think the day before, I'm, I'm reading a paper in the Tribune, I think, and they had a picture they had, they had somebody indicating Frank Wilson was sent a picture of himself, a family picture of himself with his head cut off uh, as a threat. That was in the paper. Total bullshit. That there was an article in the paper that said it was rumored the judge was sent a picture, a family picture uh, with his head cut off as a threat. But the paper reported this, but it was bullshit that that actually it happened. It never happened. It never, they're putting all kinds of bullshit in the paper about what was going on in the trial. Does your instinct tell you that the paper was responsible for that rumor? All I can do is I can tell you what happened. I can't tell what's in people's minds. But I'm looking you know, for the motive of what is, I'm, I'm trying to understand the psychology behind because it. Because they're trying to show that he's guilty as hell. The judge, the judge calls me and he says, I want to meet you. And I said, where? And he said at a restaurant over on Western, on Southwestern. So I'm with Kathy Fleming, one of my secretary, one of my secretaries, who I'm also dating. And we're on the way on the way to Greco's. I stop in there. He's all upset. He says the newspapers are killing me. These are his words, not mine. The newspapers are killing me. He said they had an article in there where somebody supposedly sent me a picture with my head cut off. He said, my wife is a nervous wreck. He said, you know, he, he said, and, you know, it's just, and Wayland's not doing, because I had already sat down with the judge and showed him what the case was. I had showed him his reports that we had with these two people. I had, I had talked to him a number of times about the case before the case ever got into his courtroom. And I showed him what a total, what a terrible case they had. And, and he says, this guy's not doing anything, he said. He said, he's not cross-examining the witnesses. He's not doing anything. Is he sick or is there something wrong with him? So anyhow, after I, after I leave there and uh, the next day I come over, I, I go over to, I go over to the uh, Bismarck again and I'm talking with Waylon and I said, what the hell is going on in the courtroom? I said, the judge got a hold of me and he's all upset. Because he said, you're not cross-examining these people. And you're not bringing out the information that I gave you. He says, what do you mean? And he says, what do you, I says, are you feeling okay? And he said, what do you mean? You're telling me how to, and I get into a fight with him, a verbal fight with him. Uh, he's telling me, what are you, you're telling, you're trying to, you're, you're trying to tell me how to, you know, how to do my job. You know, I'm a terrific lawyer and whatever. So I got the judge in one hand and I'm not there to see what's going on. But I know what kind of a case I gave him. I know what kind of a defense I gave him, and he's obviously not doing it. Anyhow, now, now when you meet with the judge, I'm sorry, wind back a moment. When you met with him, he just reached out to indicate he was getting nervous and was trying to make sure that the defense was more probative, or was he indicating that he was maybe not throw the case, or was that even discussed? It was just him to vent about being concerned about how how the defense was handling the case. Neil, all I all I can do, and I, I understand why you're asking this question. All I can do is indicate to you what happened. I have my own ideas. What's going? All I know is he was a nervous wreck, and he made me a nervous wreck because if he finds this guy guilty, you know these people are going to do their best to kill me. I mean, you know. So I mean, here I am caught in the middle of. I've got you know. On the one hand, I've got a judge now telling me that this clown lawyer is not doing a good job. 
You know, I've got the lawyer now telling me I'm doing a great job. I know what the, what a defense I had made for this person. I know what the real facts of the case are. It's a terrible, terrible case for the state. They've got no motive, none whatsoever. Their, their so-called motive is he wanted to take the governor, the, the mob wanted to take over the docks. And that's why he kills this guy who's a dock worker, doesn't own the company. He's a dock worker. What does that got to do with taking over the docks? Shooting, you know, shooting a dock worker. They've got no, they've got not, they've got no evidence of any sort, no fingerprints, no gun, uh, no nothing. There's no corroboration because the two witnesses totally give two different stories about what happened. I just know that he was a nervous wreck and he made me a nervous wreck, but there's nothing I can do about it. And now trust me, I'm a nervous wreck because I never, I never threatened the judge. I never would. And I never did. You know, I lied to these people. I lied to Harry when Harry says, well, the judge knows what will happen and whatever. And I indicated, you know, absolutely. But I never threatened the judge. And I never said to the judge, will you throw the case out? I assumed he knew what I'm talking about. This is the only case I ever did this for. It's got to be a very helpless feeling that a person like Harry Alleman, who will back up his word when he threatens somebody, threatens you. And you're in this pressure cooker. Are you thriving on that? Or are you going, why the fuck did I do this? I'm not, I'm not thriving. What do you mean? Who am I thriving? Well, I mean, in it? the sense that, do you feel like you're in the moment? Like I love this action because. No, I mean, absolutely, absolutely not. You know, I don't love the idea of being in a position where I cannot do anything. There is absolutely nothing I can do at this stage. Did you regret? Do you do you have a regret at this point? And you're you're not looking it's backwards. You're, you, you, exactly. You can't have a Neil. You cannot have regrets in the world I lived in. Once you jump off a building, that's it. It's done. I regretted. Yes, I regretted. Ever, the moment I found out why he killed him, I regretted even getting involved in the case. No question about that. I regretted after I did it. But but I had done it. You can't undo something you've done. I wa I wanted to make life easy for everybody, show that it was a it was a horrible case, and there'd be no basis for the judge to find him guilty. The, any legitimate judge would find him not guilty. Any jury would find him not guilty. But here you've got the newspapers totally putting bullshit out there as to what the what was going on in the courtroom, and it could, because I knew what the, I knew what all the facts were totally giving other information that wasn't, you know, that wasn't real. Uh, you've got, you've got a lawyer that for some reason isn't properly cross-examining or doing who knows what you've got a judge now who's a nervous wreck. No, what I, in fact, what I did indicate before, and it's what happened when, uh, when the judge ended, when I, I'm, I just knew by reading the paper and by it was on TV, it was the lead story every day on the news. The judge is going to come up with a decision tomorrow. I'll go over all the facts and all the information and render my decision tomorrow. What I did the next morning was I packed a suitcase and I got in my car and I started driving out of town because I, I was worried the judge was going to find him guilty because the judge had never told me he would find him not guilty. I never asked him that. I have no idea where I'm going to go, but I'm going to be out of town because I'm afraid the judge is going to find him guilty. I'm in the car driving. And when I hear in the radio, it was a not guilty. I was already, I was already pretty close up there to, uh, I saw the sign St. Louis. I make a U-turn and I come back and I go to counselor's row and, and I go to see Pat and so forth. Yes, I was terrified he was going to find him guilty. What was the feeling when he was not guilty? Were you ecstatic? Uh, I mean, certainly I was, but uh, I was, I was afraid he would find him guilty. So you go back to counselor's row, Marcy's there. Uh, certainly he's there. Uh, he's there every day. He's there every day. During and, the and, are, and you are, you're the bell of the ball, obviously. Yeah. I come in there and, uh, you know, he was at counselor's row table. I can still see it as I walked in, I walked into the, the door I normally do. And as I make a left. Now, there's Pat and there's, you know, the table's full of, there's a couple aldermen there and, and who knows who else. And I see him and, and we walk out in the hall. He's showing basically no emotion at all. This is Pat. And we go out and we go into the janitor's closet behind the thing. 
and uh, and he's step he's stepping he's on the steps you know uh, leading up to the the commodity firm upstairs and and he gives me an envelope. I'm expecting ten, maybe twenty thousand, maybe thirty thousand. And my my own expenses were probably about four or five thousand. I flew down to Florida a couple of times. I I put all kinds of work and effort into preparing the case, and uh, he gives me and he gives me an envelope. He says, uh, you know, then we talk about the weather or something. You know, not you know that was a great job or that was terrific or just business as usual. He gives me this envelope. We weren't in there more than about two or three minutes, and and I go out and go about my business. <laughs> I, I open the envelope upstairs. There's three thousand dollars in it. <laughs> that was my, <laughs> Were you surprised? I was shocked. Uh, but you know, but I, as I got to know these people, their whole world was money. You know, money for them. You know, but there was there was nothing was ever said about what I would charge or you know or or whatever. Nothing was ever said about any of that. And if if I hadn't gotten anything, so be it. But you know, he gives me three thousand. I have no idea where he came up with that figure. Three thousand dollars. What was the direct aftermath of Alleman being acquitted? Direct aftermath was the papers were oh you know it was you know the the case was fixed and 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 so forth. The after effect to me was. Now, I never told anybody, but I guarantee you Harry told the world, and the, I'm talking about the organized crime world. By that time, I already had owned this restaurant, Greco's, out in the south side that had all the judges coming in there, you know, had all the top police personnel. We had the mayors coming in there from all the different areas. Uh, we had, we had the, you know, the chop shop guys coming in there. And now, who do you see in the midst of all this but uh, yours truly, Robert Cooley? We had a lot of the senators and a lot of the other political people coming into Greco's. People, the movie stars and the rest from out of town, Sinatra and, and, and his crew and a bunch of others. It put me in a fantastic position. But now I, you know, okay, I'm I'm obviously very relieved. And within a couple of days, I got a phone call that Harry wanted to meet with me. It wasn't the day the day of the of thing. The very next day. He wanted to meet with me over at Mama Sue's. That was a restaurant that was owned by his dad uh, over there on Taylor Street. And he wanted to meet with me. And, you know, we were sitting there. They had, a, they had their own table right alongside the window. And uh, he was there with Butchie and with his dad. And uh, I'll bet 50 people, 50 people that I didn't know came over to shake my hand uh, because Harry had them all there at the restaurant. They were celebrating his acquittal. And so all these people, and then with Harry, they went, give him your card, give him your card. It's like he told me, bring bring a couple hundred cards when you come. These people are all excited, but I met a whole lot of new people. But I'm sure when that happened, all these other mob bosses throughout the whole county, and a lot of them were, were constantly in and out of Greco's, you know, a number of them suddenly would come up. And I became known in their world. Alleman was retried. I mean that's 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 like of historical significance. That, There's no question, right? This There's is no isn't this the only case ever to have never been done before. Never. So when I came in and started cooperating and 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 build, we were building other cases. I you know I told them, I said you know I met with him and whatever and, you know oh you mean he knew the case was being fixed and I said yes and then we said we came up with the idea that. He had not. He, he was not in jeopardy because he knew ahead of time the case was going to be fixed, and that was the basis on which. So now, that was the basis on which we were going to try to get him retried. Now this had never been done before. Now what's the timeline between his acquittal in trial one and then you talking to the feds to hatch the plan to retry him? Is that years? Well, what, it was in the late. It was around seventy eight, seventy nine. It, what happened was when I came, I came into the to see the feds in '86. I think it was in March of '86. It was about eight years afterwards. There's no statutes of limitations yeah. on retrying somebody because it had never been done before. There was double double jeopardy was in effect, which meant if you were found not guilty, you could never be tried again. We and, and this, like I say, is is unbelievable news and yet the the world doesn't know anything about it only a few people and they run right over it this is unbelievable news it's brand new law we we talked about the fact that i had met with him he knew that the case was being fixed because uh we were going to try to show that he knew he was not in jeopardy 
He knew he was going to be found not guilty. Therefore, he was not in jeopardy. And therefore, we wanted to try him again. So what happened was, by now, he had gotten out of the penitentiary. He had done about 10 or 12 years uh, on, a, on, a, on a federal case. Uh, shortly after, you know, I got him to not guilty. He was he was charged with that, and uh, and he lost that case. And he was in the penitentiary, and he had gotten out, and they knew where he was. And what they what I agreed to do was go talk to him uh, to try and you know to try and see if we can get him to admit that he knew the case was fixed and whatever. And we were going to try to get him retried. I knew where he was. He was hanging out over at the Maywood Racetrack. Maywood Racetrack was closed during the day. It was night race, night racing there. It was harness racing there at night. And uh, during the day, they had off-track betting there. And I had been there a number of times before because Bobby Abenati and Marco and the rest of them would hang out there in the daytime. I knew that he was in the basement, the private section. There was a, an area that was closed in the basement where they had a couple of a couple of rooms in there. And I was told that's where he would be during the week, Monday through Friday. That's where he would be. So I put on a wire and I arranged to go see him. So I, I go in there. I'm upstairs first with some people for, for a bit. And then I knew where he was downstairs. So I walked down there and I really got no business being down there. I walked down there and I'm walking towards the back and I walk by the room and I can see him in this room. He's in this room with there's about four or five people in this little room with him. And they had a TV. They had a TV up in the wall up there. And I walk by and I see him. And I walked back towards the the end of the the end of the wall, and there was like a bar there. And then as I'm then I'm walking back, and as I walk back, I I look in there, and I walk oh, and I walk into the room, and he's sitting there, and and he's giving me a funny look. He didn't apparently he didn't he didn't recognize me, because it had been like ten years since I had seen him. And when I saw him in there, I walk, I walk in there. Hey, Harry, how are you? And, and he gives me a funny look. He says, who the fuck are you? And I said, Bob Cooley. Bob, oh, Bob. See, when he was in the penitentiary, he was calling me. He wanted me to hire his kid. And I hired his kid. <laughs> then I had to fire his kid. Talk about that. But I, I, hired, his, I hired his kid because his kid was, in, was going to go to law school or was in law school, I think. And I, and I hired it. He wanted me to hire the kid, so I did. You know, he wanted me to let him clerk and let him, you know, go run around to the courts with me and whatever and see what I do because he, he had heard I was a terrific lawyer from other people. And, uh, and so I hired this kid. Well, after a period of time, the kid would, be, the kid would come in there. I could smell the alcohol in his breath. The final straw was when I come walking into my office one day, and uh, he was supposed to be in there doing some, you know, doing some, doing, doing some work. And he's sitting behind my desk talking to these these clients of mine who are mobsters, uh, you know, like like he's one of them. I he got said, his feet know, up on your desk? No, but he was sitting there. He was he was just sitting there, you know, like you know, like he's me. And I had warned him before. One time, a, a time before, you know, when clients would come in, he's over there talking with them and socializing with them. And I just told him that, you know, that, that's not going to go. And uh, But I come in there, and he's sitting behind my desk. And there's a couple of these people, you know, uh, like, he's the, like he's the lawyer. It just got me angry, and I just told him, you know, that's it. You got to go. And, and uh, of course, Harry called me, like, the next day. And, you know, what are you going to fire on my kid? And I just said, Harry, I, I just can't have him, period. Okay? I mean, he got real mad at me, but he got over that. And when I see him there, he says, you know, who the fuck are you? And I, when I said, oh, Bob, Bob, and he, he, oh, he comes out, he shakes my hand, and, and, and I'm walking him now slowly towards away from the, uh, the front of the room. And you're wearing, then, you're wearing a wire. Yeah, sure, sure, I've got a wire on. And we walk towards the back, and when we get, toward, when we get to, by this bar, and I said, gee, Harry, and interesting, I just bumped into a friend of ours. Just a couple of days ago, who's that? And I said, Frank Wilson. And the moment I said that, his eyes all but popped out. And he says, I don't want to talk about that. And he turns around and he walks away and he goes back into the room. And, and I'm standing, <laughs> now I'm wearing a wire and, and, and I'm standing there and I'm thinking, I'm going to get the hell out of here. 
because, you know, what I'm worried about now, he's got, you know, he's got like four mobsters back in this room. And one of them was his, it was his brother-in-law who I knew. I figured, you know, nah, I, I got to go in there. I got to walk back in there. But it was a, it was a decision I had to make, but I did. Because you're thinking it just, it shows that you're not scared and you're not hiding something. But if you disappear, it's more suspicious. Well, because I'm, what I'm worried about, if I walk in there, these guys are going to search me. That's what I'm worried about. I'm carrying, and if they, if, if they attempt to, I'm going to start shooting. I've got two guns on. I'm, I'm wearing two guns at this time because I've, you know, I've had a couple of other close calls and, and the feds wanted me to leave town because they were afraid that these people were on to me because too many things were happening right around me, including that wire in Counselor's Row and over at the, uh, over at the racetrack when I was bringing agents into the racetrack to meet Fiorola and some, some of these other people and they arrest these same people. So I'm carrying two guns uh, because, you know, a lot of times, you know, I have to go to the club and whatever, and there's 10, 15 people in there when I have to go in there and I'm wearing a wire. I'm worried at any time when I walk into one of these places, you know, they're going to suddenly have, you know, want to want to search me and I'm, that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, I debate walking out, but I figured, no, I got to walk in there. So I walk into the room. I walk into the room and he's sitting back down uh, and, you know, sitting back down at the side of the one table. And, uh, you know, and I'm trying to make small talk. Well, how is, how, you know, gee, Harry, you, you look pretty good. You look like you're in good shape. You, you haven't seemed to have aged an hour or whatever. And, and we're, we're just talking. And but he, he's looking at me real funny. Like, it's almost like he's tempted. You know, he's looking, you know, not just at my face, but he's looking at my body. Maybe looking to see if he can see a lump or who knows. And, and I have no idea what's going on in this guy's mind. And you got to realize this guy's, you know, one of the top killers there. And they had plenty of them. He's one of the top killers there. So we have, we, and I, I stay there about maybe about five, 10 minutes. And, and I remember among other things and him telling me, I'm never going back to the penitentiary. I'm never, and what he doesn't know is I'm planning on sending you back. When I do leave there, I don't just leave. I go back upstairs. And when I go upstairs, I'm talking with Bobby Abinati. I remember and with uh, Tony, uh, Tony Doty was there and I'm talking with the two of them. And I look, and out of the corner of my eye, I see his brother-in-law. He's about maybe 40, 50 feet away. Obviously, Harry had sent him out, sent him out to see what I'm up to. And uh, and so when I and, and when I spot him there, then I walk over and I make a bet. I walk over to the window, and I, and I bet I bet a horse, and then I come back, and and I can see he's sitting over there, maybe about I'd say about 40, 50 feet away. All by himself, he's just sitting there watching me. Uh, so I stayed. I stayed around probably for about an hour. But what I'm worried about now is that maybe they're setting a trap for me or whatever. You know, because I don't know what goes on in their minds. Obviously, Harry was suspicious of me. Yeah, when I finally leave, I, I make sure nobody's following me. And when I get over by my car, I look underneath it just to make sure there's no fucking bomb put in there. Because these people, you know, in the past, these people had done that with a few people. And I left. So, I mean, Harry was a, I'm sure when the feds had, you know, Louis Almeida try to talk to Harry, he got the same type thing. I'm sure that's what happened, you know, on the fire occasion. But uh, that was my meeting with Harry. So, anyhow, now, you know, that was the, that was the basis of, uh, of uh, retrying him. We had to show that he was not in jeopardy because he knew that the case was fixed. Cause I talked about the meeting up there, you know, in the motel where he, he, he wanted to make sure he said, I, and I assured him the case was going to be, the case was going to be fixed. I'm thankful that, you know, we, we went to trial on that. We had a long trial before judge, uh, uh, before Mike, before Mike Tuman, which is so ironic when he went to trial, he's represented by Harry Alleman, who he met through me. And uh, you know, the judge in the case is Mike Tuman, who's one of my close friends. The sec and my secretary, who had become a prosecutor, was the prosecutor that uh, that worked on getting the case. You know, getting the getting the uh, the judge to rule the case could be retried. When we got the okay to retry the case, they they fought it all the way up to the Supreme Court. Wait, hold on a second. This is worth discussing in further detail. So when the case was retried. Your secretary was now a prosecutor. She was a prosecutor. In fact, the, the judge is your I friend. Had, 
the judge is my my call and my close friends. Yeah, and the lawyer representing him is Harry is 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 uh, Alan Ackerman, who he met through me. Alan was the one that I you know I officed with for years. And at this stage, you're gone. You're you're out of Chicago. We won't leap that far forward. But when this trial happens, you're not around. Yeah, you know, no, I had to come. Back. They brought me in. We had to go before a court and have a complete hearing as to whether or not we could try him over again. In other words, you know, to have the judge throw out the verdict. The judge had to throw out the verdict of not guilty, and we had to get a new indictment, and we had to reindict him, and we indicted him all over again. So it was not a retrial. It was a it was a new trial. Uh, he was tried. He was uh, in, he was tried under. They went before the grand jury and they got an indictment on him again. Did and you have got, to testify in front of that grand jury, or were you? Oh yeah. So you you no, had to sit no, in the box. No, not not the grand jury. I had to testify in court before Mike Tuman. Was Harry Alman present at this stage? Well, sure, he's present. He's certainly he's present. What had happened after I met with him in the at the racetrack? He got charged again under the federal because because when he got out, they showed that he got a hundred thousand dollars from Joe Nagal. So they charged him with getting him with getting a part of the proceeds from criminal activity. <laughs> and, and he was up in Oxford with Oxford, Wisconsin. During this time I'm talking to Pat Quinn. Pat Quinn was the state prosecutor that was prosecuting Harry, and I became very close friends with Pat. Uh, he was a real, he was a character. He was a lot like me. He, you know, had a strange sense of humor and was always joking and laughing and was sharp as a tack. You know, he, he would tell me what was going on. This is when I'm supposed to be in witness protection. I'm not. I'm, I'm living in different places. I'm living around the country and just coming back in for the trials. And I'm meeting with Pat in Phoenix, Arizona. We're meeting at a real nice resort there while we're preparing to try to get him retried. And uh, during that time, he's telling me about his visits. In fact, he told me about his first visit to, to meet Harry. He said, I went up there to see him up in Oxford. He said, and when I when I came in, I, I introduced myself. I'm here because I want to talk to you to see if you want to plead guilty. Uh, we've got an indictment on you on a case. And he goes, which one? <laughs> and he says, which one? <laughs> with what he said to him when he went to see him. He's also telling me about when he they're listening to all of Harry's telephone calls that are all being taped. Harry's telling people where they have to sit in the car coming up to see him. You tell my daughter to sit here and you tell this one to sit there. It's unbelievable. He's telling me what a what a control freak this guy was. They needed me to testify and the uh, the judge had to believe me and then later the jury that I met with Harry and, uh, you know, and I told how Harry said, are you sure he's going to fix it? And I told him yes and OK. And and I, I told him, too, what he said. Well, you know what will happen if he doesn't. You'll have a problem. After the judge ruled that he could be retried, they appealed that all the way up to the Supreme Court and not at the U.S. Supreme Court. So now we tried him a second time. Was that a bench trial? Or did that go to a jury? No, no, that was a jury. No, it was a jury. And that was an easy conviction? Yeah, he got convicted and got sentenced to 100 years, wound up dying in prison. He got found guilty in the same murder. That was uh, the fact that this is, you know, there no longer is double jeopardy. If you can show the person, you can show the person was aware that he was going to be found not guilty, they can be retried. And to your knowledge, and to your knowledge, has this been used again as a tool no, to retry been, people? It's never been done. Nobody's ever attempted it because people don't know anything about it. So, so we jumped ahead. Uh, we jumped ahead almost a decade. I did. I did find that Alamin was initially tried. I think in '77. That retrial that we just discussed was ten years thereafter. The first trial. This is per the Chicago Tribune. Was 1977. Right. The murder was 72, September 72, but the trial was 77. That concludes Conversation 7B and the Harry Alleman journey. You don't want to miss what's coming next. Stay tuned. Follow us. Make sure you know when the next episode drops. Thank you for listening.